Two flight attendants stood in the galley, smiling at each other as the plane prepared for takeoff. Usually, it would be a hectic time, ushering passengers in and settling them. Yet, this is a time for fun. Their flight is a ghost flight, devoid of passengers. If you ever wondered what the crew gets up to on empty flights, you're about to find out. They took a serving tray each, but had no intention of preparing food and headed into two separate aisles. It's aisle surfing time! The engines fired up as the plane rolls from the terminal to the beginning of its designated runway. The attendants placed the trays on the floor and stand on them. They held on to the seats and awaited takeoff. They're laughing as the plane quickly accelerates. In no time, it's hurtling down the runway. As it rises into the air, the interior tilts. They let go of the seats, and as the acceleration continued, so did they. Straight down the aisle. The first person crashes out on row 8, while the second continues until the end. A new personal best. Victory is sweet. While it does sound over the top, according to a safety trainer on the travel forum of Cora, aisle surfing is a real thing. The faint of heart could take the softer option to sit on the tray as it slides downwards. The imagination fires as to what else they may get up to. Laps around the interior, cartwheels down the aisles, skipping. They have a closed air cinema with their colleagues. Air discos or karaoke on board of the plane. If you're a flight attendant and your crew wants to party, choose a song on the seat screen and take the announcement mic. Your colleagues are waiting. There are no passengers around to watch your dancing. You can do anything. The sky is the limit. A crew member made a viral video while singing in the aisle of an empty plane. Millions have watched the quirky video. It's a shame there were no passengers. It would have been excellent entertainment. Some have even said they ate food designated for passengers. However, anyone admitting to such conduct or being caught would see them face immediate dismissal, even with a new surfing record. You may be wondering why there would be a ghost flight in the first place. There are many reasons. In Europe, airlines must fulfill their obligations and continue the flight even if no passengers are on board. Similar legislation exists in America. There are time slots that allow for takeoff and landing. The European Commission has a use it or lose it rule. If airlines don't comply at least 80% of the time, they risk losing their slots to the competition. Aircraft also can't be left at the airport overnight, as you might with a car. Sometimes they need to be prepared for storage and return to a particular location. In some situations, airlines continued flights and used passenger jets to transport freight instead. This type of proactive thinking has saved the financial lives of some companies. When you hear the term ghost flights, you may be thinking something a little spookier, like in a horror movie. And you'd be right, there have been actual documented ghost flights. In 1943, a flight on a combat mission disappeared following a raid on Naples. In Libya, the wreck was discovered, but not until 15 years later. None of the crew was found. The following year, a second expedition to the site found water fresh enough to drink, coffee that still had flavor, and radios and machine guns in working order. The public became fascinated. It was a ghost flight mystery. For most flight attendants, their everyday experiences aboard an empty plane aren't particularly spooky or as much fun as our aisle surfers. They're far too busy for all of that. Your typical plane will land, and the passengers depart, leaving behind quite a mess. Not everyone is as tidy as you and I. At this point, the cleaners race on board, vacuuming floors, picking up rubbish, and wiping down all surfaces so that the new passengers have an excellent clean environment. The cleaners must work fast. They have a deadline. The plane must be ready to take off again in under 80 minutes, sometimes a lot less, depending on the aircraft. This time is called turnaround. The more extended the plane sits on the tarmac, the less money the airline makes. They want to make the turnaround to be as short as possible. Time is money after all. While the plane is being cleaned, the ground crew are refueling. Many thousands of gallons are required, depending on the aircraft's size, weight, and length of the necessary journey. Without waiting for the cleaning crew to finish, the catering crew entered the plane. They often have to step around each other as meals are stored in the galley. The allocated meals must at least match the number of passengers on the imminent flight. Like fixing a torn seat, any minor repairs have to wait until a more extended stopover. As the organized chaos continues, the baggage holds are emptied by ground staff while the new baggage arrives. Some of the more complex handlings can be moving the luggage to the carousels. There isn't much room, and sometimes the handler will have to crouch down low to get the job done. A lot of strength and skill is required, and the clock is ticking. 
The attendants are busy too. They must ensure that the catering crew has filed the upcoming meals and drinks in their proper places. They check off their inventory and prepare for the incoming passengers. They exercise their face muscles. Soon, they'll be wearing that smile non-stop and saying, good day, 200 times in a row. While they're always friendly, they have to deal with all sorts of behaviors, which can test the patience of even the sturdiest of attendants. Based on a list of 17 behaviors observed through the years, a flight attendant would give the following recommendations to the passengers. The flight attendants at the boarding door say hello to every passenger. Sometimes over 200 times in a row, would you please say hello back? They're happy to help and recommend passengers push the buzzer only when necessary. The attendants collect trash during specific times, wear gloves, and prefer not to race back and forth. There's something that bothers most people when passengers take off their shoes. Please make sure to have a fresh pair of socks. If you sit in the exit row, please don't put any luggage under the seat in front of you, because it can block the way of the flight attendants. For example, if they need to use rubber slides urgently. Everybody knows about the rule to turn off the mobile phone, but not everybody knows why it's so important. Let's suppose all the passengers turn on their phones. In that case, the high-frequency electromagnetic fields of the mobile phones can disturb the plane's navigation system and cause false indications. There is a risk the pilot can make a wrong decision about the landing, especially if it's in terrible weather. The crew recommends keeping the seatbelt fastened during the whole flight, even if the sign is turned off, because heavy turbulence can occur unexpectedly, and the plane can be put 900 feet lower. You can loosen up your belt to feel comfortable, so the flight attendants will be happy you're safe. Passengers get into a confined space on board an airplane and may unconsciously begin an instinctive struggle for a place under the sun. Please keep in mind that this is a temporary condition. Treat each other with respect and keep your seat back straight while the food is served or when your neighbor gets to the seat. Passengers sometimes leave their headphones on while conversing with a flight attendant. The attendants may ask the passenger if they want refreshment, and they might get a blank stare in return. Would you mind taking off your headphones? Something that happens on every flight is when the plane is about to take off and someone decides that they want to go to the bathroom. It's all about good timing. Preferably not when the plane is hurtling down the runway at full speed. Please wait till the takeoff is over because it may be dangerous. While their job can be tiring, Fortunately for us, flight attendants are patient, kind, and friendly people. They push on regardless of how tired they may be. International flights in particular can be long, taxing affairs. So, who could blame them if they find themselves on a ghost flight and decide to let their hair down, aisle surfing a bit with pleasurable distraction? And what would you get up to if you happen to find yourself on an empty flight? Want to catch a glimpse of what flying might look like in the future? Then you're in the right place. Economy class lie flat bunk beds, vertical flying vehicles, AI-powered in-flight meal service. Buckle up and let's start our flight. But first, I need to ask you, have you ever heard of the Crystal Cabin Awards? Oh, those are like the Oscars of aviation interior design. And here are some of the most recent winners. Meet SkyNest, a lie-flat bed for people traveling in economy class. These nests are supposed to be used on long-haul flights. The design is based on a sleep pod island located in the middle of the plane. And you can book a four-hour time slot if you want to take a real nap during your flight. The best news is that this design is likely to be introduced next year. While traveling in premium economy on long routes, you'll be able to use smarter seating design. It includes wider seats and twin armrests, which means no more fighting for space with your neighbors. Plus, there will be fully flexible rows with cushions that can be elevated, creating lie-flat beds. Lufthansa Group has promised that premium passengers will be able to book suites with double beds and travel on temperature-controllable heated or cooled seats. As you see, these days, airline companies are working hard on new designs of aircraft cabins, and it might impact the entire future of air travel. At the moment, they focus on travelers' experience within the walls of the plane. As a result, we have some mind-boggling products. Check out Singapore Airlines First Class Suites, or Air France's La Première Cabin. 
which is believed to become one of the best first-class cabins in the skies. It's going to feature suites equipped with separate sofas and chairs, and each suite will have five windows along the cabin wall. This will make it the longest first-class suite in the world. But then, Airbus went and patented the idea of a more interactive flight experience, especially for those lucky passengers occupying window seats. With the help of special eye-tracking equipment, the aircraft might be able to highlight significant objects you're looking at and provide you with detailed information, appearing on a semi-transparent display on the window. The patent also claims that you could send data to devices connected by Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. This way, takeoffs and landings would get much more exciting, and you'd be able to get information about a new country or city. Qatar Airlines, in turn, came up with the idea of Q Suites. It looks like this. On the sides, you have individual suites, while the middle part can be transformed. You can choose to have a double suite to travel together with your partner, or you can have some private space, or even move the walls and turn the place into a quad suite that you can use for a meeting. There might also be some improvements in economy class. They're bound to bring more comfort, especially on a long-haul flight. A company called Zodiac Seats filed a patent based on a zigzag configuration of seats. Look at this aisle, which contains three and four seats, with each of them facing in the opposite direction. This allows for way more shoulder space than regular seating. Plus, passengers have a lot of leg space. Yes, some people might feel a bit uncomfortable having to face their neighbor for more than eight hours straight, but aren't these space improvements worth it? Now, you might know that moving around the cabin while flight attendants are serving meals and beverages is kind of tricky. Plus, you have to eat at a specific time with everyone else. Or, if you're not feeling hungry, forego the meal altogether. Well, robots might be the solution. One company has suggested using perfectly sized pods that could slide along the rail in the middle of the aisle, delivering drinks and food ordered by passengers. This way, you could get your meal at the most suitable time for you, without leaving your seat. This solution is likely to solve the problems with meal service. Even better, it might allow for fewer galleys and large planes. Unfortunately, this idea was filed 60 years ago and hasn't been implemented yet. So maybe it's not as great as it sounds. Another idea connected with in-flight meal service includes using AI. According to its creators, the technology will record what passengers leave on their trays and later use this data to suggest various catering plans on subsequent flights. Now, even though these innovations sound like they're going to make traveling way more comfortable, they're not exactly revolutionary. But look at these innovations. Vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Hyundai Transys's air taxi cabin concept optimizes space and prioritizes your privacy in a shared cabin. If we talk about short flights, there's City Airbus Next Gen. That's an all-electric, vertical takeoff and landing vehicle with four seats based on the lift and cruise concept. It can operate within the range of 50 miles and has a cruise speed of 74 miles per hour. Another amazing prospect is passenger aircraft with AI co-pilots, or even pilots. Some experts claim that planes could potentially be flown on a fully automated basis. Not everyone agrees with this idea, though. A skilled pilot is part of a complicated safety system that reduces risks and keeps passengers safe. Pilots have to be navigators, technicians, engineers, and weather experts. On a regular working day, a pilot needs to deal with ground crew, other air crew, cabin crew, air traffic control, and passengers. That's a lot. And don't forget that they need to communicate well, not only in aviation terms, but also on an interpersonal level. Will AI be able to do the same? Time will tell. But let's get back to the boldest ideas about the future of air travel. Some experts think that sometime around 2040, you'll be able to catch a hypersonic plane ride. 
Lots of people believe that the era of supersonic planes finished in 2003 when the Concorde commercial airplane was decommissioned after decades of being unprofitable. But it seems the situation might change soon. New supersonic aircraft will fly at incredible heights, and their speed is likely to be at least six times the speed of any other passenger plane. Traveling from New York to London, in this case, will take less than two hours. By comparison, these days, it takes a conventional airplane eight hours to fly from one of these cities to the other. There is one problem, though. The supersonic plane tickets will cost a lot. And statistically, people tend to prioritize price over speed. So experts don't think that a lot of people will be eager to pay a few thousand dollars to get from London to Sydney in four hours. Plus, such planes will need a lot of liquid hydrogen fuel. And at the moment, it's not cheap. By the way, you might not recognize a plane from 2050. These flying machines will keep changing for the next several decades. And the chances are high that, at some moment, windows will start to disappear from airplanes altogether. This way, aircraft will become stronger and better suited for high speeds. Windows make planes heavier which results in larger fuel consumption. No wonder cargo planes don't have windows. Planes will also become sleeker and will likely be covered with solar panels. There's also a concept of a plane with its cabin made out of transparent polymers. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd ever board such a plane. Talk about aerophobia. The chances are that in a few decades, we'll see a hypersonic plane with a jet engine that can turn into a rocket that can fly into space. Liquid oxygen would get injected into the exhaust, turning the engine into a rocket. It would help the aircraft reach enormous speeds. And on the way back, the engine would turn into a regular jet engine once again. Welcome aboard our flight from London to Miami. It will take us four hours and 30 minutes. The weather in Miami is... Wait, did the pilot just say four hours and a half? It sounds like a dream, but it will most likely become our reality in less than 10 years from now. Boom Supersonic, an aircraft manufacturer, is working on a passenger supersonic jet called the Overture that will be able to carry 65 to 80 people at twice the speed of current commercial aircraft. One of the major American airlines is interested in buying around 40 planes. The plane that's going to cost $200 million has recently passed the wind tunnel tests. If all goes well, the first finished Overture prototype will roll off the line in 2025 and will travel at nearly twice the speed of sound. The plane will be able to show its top speed over the sea, so it should be ideal for transatlantic flights. And then, traveling from, say, New York to Paris should take no longer than four hours. But first, it will have to get all the official permissions to do it. Some people are skeptical about the whole passenger superjet concept as they remember the story of the Concorde. That high-end plane delivered people from London to New York in about three hours and serviced other transatlantic connections. The tickets cost a whopping $10,000 per seat and passengers got access to a super exclusive lounge with lobster and Angus beef for lunch. The Concorde went on its final commercial flight in 2003. It was a huge fuel guzzler. Plus, there are many complaints from people living near airports about the noise it produced. The Overture is supposed to be more fuel efficient, lighter, and have better software to make it more aerodynamic. The noise might still be a problem though, because supersonic aircraft need aerodynamic engines, which are pretty loud. That will definitely change in the future, as planes have gone a long way since their first flight in 1903. Back then, the Wright brothers started the Aerial Age with a 12-second flight traveling 120 feet in North Carolina. The top speed at that time was around 30 miles per hour, but it still seemed pretty impressive. The world's first passenger airline service took off just 11 years later. The flight from St. Petersburg, Florida to Tampa, Florida lasted 23 minutes. Covering the distance by car around the bay took about 20 hours, so that was a great time saver. The tickets cost $5 and were sold out 16 weeks in advance, but the airline went out of business in four months. 
The new age in aviation began in the 1950s when they introduced the turbofan engine. It became possible as they started using temperature-resistant materials and complex air cooling systems. Planes also became lighter as they were made of composite materials. The wings have also improved over the years. The airfoil, that's the part thanks to which the air travels faster above the wing than below it, became a real game changer. Thanks to it, the planes keep a low speed during takeoff, which means they move smoothly and burn less fuel. The fastest plane in the world so far is North American X-15. It was rocket-powered and made of aluminum and titanium. A huge wedge tail helped it stay stable at that super speed. The rocket plane set the world's altitude record, reaching an altitude of 67 miles. Oh, and to make it even more impressive, it happened back in 1967. So, if it was possible back then already, why don't we all just fly rocket planes? Or at least supersonics, especially on long-distance flights? In terms of speed, passenger planes are still where they were 50 years ago. Mostly because speeding flights up would also make them way more expensive. Flying faster means burning more fuel. Plus, supersonic engines are expensive to produce and maintain. Another reason is natural forces. The winds affect the speed of a plane, and no technology can control the wind. A strong tailwind can help it move forward at a higher speed, and a headwind can slow the aircraft down. Planes mostly fly at altitudes of up to 7 miles. Up there, the air is thinner, which means there's less resistance, and a plane can fly faster and save some fuel. Also, the lower temperatures make the jet engines more efficient. Another perk of flying through that part of the atmosphere is that it's less turbulent, so flights go smoother. Private jets can't fly that high. They're smaller, and their engines aren't strong enough to reach such an altitude, so they stick around to 15,000 feet. Ever notice those white trails that planes leave behind? Their official name is contrails, and they're like artificial clouds planes leave behind. When the plane reaches its cruising altitude, temperatures get quite low, about negative 67 degrees Fahrenheit, and the water turns into particles of ice. The higher the level of humidity is, the bigger those trails get, and you can see them long after the plane has disappeared. So, thick and long contrails can be a sign of an upcoming storm. Sometimes contrails can even be colorful. The droplets of water that are formed up in the atmosphere can freeze in different sizes. They all reflect sunlight at different wavelengths, causing the effect of a rainbow. When all the colors mix, it appears white, the most common contrail color. Airplanes don't take off with the wind, but actually against it. It's kind of like a kite. To make it fly, you launch it against the wind, and there it goes. That's because there are four forces of flight, lift, weight, thrust, and drag. The lift is generated because the speed of the air is higher above the kite than below it. The kite is pushed upwards. This is the lifting force. Going through a storm is one pretty scary experience, but is it really as dangerous as it seems? In fact, the most critical moments in windy weather are takeoff and landing. Plane manufacturers test their aircraft and specify speed limits at which the pilots should move in different weather conditions. At some airports, the winds are pretty severe all year round, so landing can get pretty wobbly. It requires a real pro of a pilot to land when the wind strikes the runway. Sometimes, the wind unexpectedly changes its speed and direction. The pilot really has to know what they're doing to land when the wind direction changes. Otherwise, the risk of overshooting the runway is pretty real. Extreme heat is another weather condition that can stop a plane from flying. Airplanes fly by generating lift with their wings. The air below the wings takes the plane up. In extreme heat, an airplane can't produce that much lift. That's because hot air expands and becomes way less dense than cold air. With less lift, the plane may find it really hard to take off and fly. Electronics will unlikely respond well to extreme heat or humidity, and the AC system may fail. Smaller jets can't operate at a temperature of over 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Larger Airbus and Boeing planes perform the best below 126 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Those mysterious chimes you hear during the flight are a kind of a secret language the crew uses to communicate with each other. The chime you hear shortly after takeoff informs the crew that the landing gear is getting retracted. A single chime during the flight is a sign that one of the passengers needs the assistance of the crew. When they're serving meals and run out of food and drinks, they can ask their colleagues to share using a high and low chime combo. Three low tones mean serious turbulence is approaching, so the crew needs to buckle up. Have you ever noticed the flashing light in the cabin before takeoff? You have nothing to worry about. It occurs when the pilot disconnects a plane from the airport power supply and it switches to the onboard one. This rapid transition may cause flashing. The Himalayas have some of the highest peaks in the world, including Mount Everest. But it's no surprise airplanes find it difficult to navigate the area. But why are commercial airplanes actually banned from flying there? For starters, these mountains have an average height of more than 20,000 feet. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the entire world, stands at 29,037 feet high above sea level. The area is rough, filled with snow, and has almost no flat surfaces. In case of sudden cabin depressurization, it would be really difficult to perform an emergency landing since there's literally no flat area there. More so, the low oxygen environment at such an altitude means there's likely to be a lot of turbulence. Not only is it really unpleasant for passengers, but random air movements and high wind velocity means that it's really difficult to maneuver the airplane. This area is also quite low populated, so there's not much there in terms of radar systems. And radar is crucial for aviation safety. Without radars, pilots would be unable to communicate with the ground to figure out flight conditions. It can also get so cold up there that jet fuel might completely freeze. Sure, the fuels used in airplanes usually freeze at around negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it may be possible above Everest. The lowest temperature was recorded there back in December 2004, when thermometers showed a staggering minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So, no wonder pilots don't want to ever take that risk, especially on a commercial flight. Among the few airports located in the Himalayas, there's one considered to be the most challenging to land in the world. Only eight pilots on the planet are certified to do it. It's called Paro International Airport, and it's located in Bhutan, a landlocked country in the eastern Himalayas. First, landing there is so dangerous because you're literally flying through some of the world's tallest mountain peaks. Not to mention that those eight pilots also have to consider strong winds. Despite the challenges, they do manage to safely land over 30,000 people each year. Moving further, there's no radar there to guide the pilots, so they need to maneuver the aircraft entirely in manual mode. The pilots need to track their movements based on specific visual landmark checkpoints as they approach the runway. Moreover, flights are only allowed there during daylight hours and under good visibility. These pilots also need to watch out for utility poles and roofs on the hillsides too. It means they often squeeze their planes between mountain peaks at 45 degree angles before dropping quickly onto the runway. No wonder only two airlines fly to Paro International Airport. Apart from these commercial pilots, there are specially trained helicopter rescue pilots who spend most of their career at 20,000 feet in the sky. Most of the time, they partner with equally experienced climbers who train by crossing the Kumbu Icefall. It's dubbed the most dangerous square mile on the planet. Made up of ice pillars as tall as a six-story building, this huge stretch of the glacier on Everest's western side is filled with bottomless ice holes. It takes between four to 12 hours to get from one edge of the icefall to the other, depending on the experience of the climber. You may think it's a pretty serene location since you're literally only surrounded by ice and snow, but these local professionals claim otherwise. One Everest veteran said that the noise was actually the worst part of the job. The mountain produces awful squeaking sounds and sometimes even sighs. It often makes people feel like it's talking to them, warning them about the treacherous environment. Mount Everest isn't the only no-fly zone in the world. Surprisingly, Disney parks are also part of this exclusive club. So you won't ever be able to look out of your plane window and see the beauty of fairy tale castles from up above. 
In recent years, a lot of crowded tourist attractions, including Disney parks, have increased their security measures to make sure their visitors are as safe as possible. As such, no aircraft is allowed to fly within 3,000 feet of Disneyland in California or Walt Disney World in Florida. It was initially a temporary ban, but this rule became permanent back in 2003. Some other places don't have planes flying over them because of their historical importance, like Machu Picchu, located in the Peruvian Andes Mountains. There's also a large number of rare wildlife species and plants that grow exclusively in this area. It's crucial that they're protected as well as possible. What does it have to do with planes not flying over that area? Firstly, it reduces the volume of harmful chemicals in the area. Secondly, if a plane ever needed to perform an emergency landing in this location, it'd cause irreversible damage to buildings and wildlife. Surprisingly, planes can fly over the Greek Parthenon in Athens, but with one condition, not to get closer than 5,000 feet above it. This way, the historical building is kept a bit more protected from any emergency landings, since there are specially designated areas around it. You won't be able to see the Taj Mahal from above either, since it's one of the most important, oldest, and most beautiful pieces of architecture in the world, it also needs added security features. This building dates back to the 1600s. UNESCO announced it a World Heritage Site in 1983. The Indian authorities set up a no-fly zone above it in 2006. They did it to safeguard not only the building itself, but also the crowds of tourists that come there each year. 7 to 8 million people. Buckingham Palace is well known for being the residence of British monarchs. So, for the Queen's security, a no-fly zone was set up here too. Planes aren't allowed to fly over Windsor Castle either to make sure the royal family is equally protected. Other important British buildings with no-fly zones include Number 10 Downing Street, the British Prime Minister's official residence and office, and the Houses of Parliament. George Washington's home in Mount Vernon, Virginia, can only have planes flying above it at more than 1,500 feet. The historical wooden mansion was built for President George Washington between 1758 and 1778. Unfortunately, the building has seen a lot of damage over the years. So, in an effort to preserve it better, authorities decided to prohibit vibrations produced by flying aircraft. That's why another no-fly zone was established there. It covers the airspace above this National Historic Landmark. That's probably the reason why you'll rarely see pictures of this house from above. Since it's the resident of the US President, it's not allowed to fly over Washington, DC. It's also the home of Congress and other establishments. So, the authorities set a special flight rules area, stretching for 30 miles around Ronald Reagan International Airport. This means that it's one of the airports with the most precise takeoffs and landings. Pilots have to carefully tackle no-fly zones, which sometimes results in uncomfortable takeoffs for passengers. Whenever a pilot breaks a no-fly zone, it's a big problem, like the one that happened back in 2005 when a pilot accidentally steered the plane into a prohibited zone. The capital had to be evacuated immediately, and their regular activities were interrupted. Other capitals of the world have similar requirements, like Budapest, for example. In the capital city of Hungary, planes aren't allowed to fly over the ancient inner city of Pest and the Buda Hills. Almost all air traffic is generally prohibited above Paris, too, with some exceptions. Aircraft flying no lower than 6,500 feet. Flying helicopters are also a big no-no within the city limits. Only certain choppers undertaking precise missions can get special authorization. Generally, passenger planes aren't allowed near the island of Manhattan either, partly because of the really tall buildings there and the added risk of collision, but mostly because all three major New York airports, John F. Kennedy International Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, and LaGuardia Airport are very close to each other, so the air traffic in the area has to be really well thought out to make sure the planes don't cross paths. Pilots can't eat similar meals when they're working. Imagine that you're on a transoceanic flight. The airplane is flying over the Pacific Ocean. Flight attendants deliver the dinner meals. Everyone is enjoying the pasta. The sauce tastes a bit funny though. Hmm, that's probably okay. After all, you are eating an aircraft meal. It can't taste like a five-star chef plate. 
Time goes by. Oh no, you were right. Something was indeed wrong with the food. But if all the passengers have the same problem, so do the pilots. To prevent both of them being out of order, pilots are advised not to eat the same meal at the same time. In such a scenario, if one pilot feels bad, the other one can take over. I mean, this is not an imperative rule stated by the Federal Aviation Administration, but most airlines make their own rules about this matter. Flight attendants have access to hidden equipment, such as a defibrillator, supplemental oxygen, a fire extinguisher, and duct tape. But probably the most interesting gear they have is handcuffs. These objects are there to protect passengers from others, and sometimes from themselves. Turns out that flight attendants have everything they need to defuse a troublemaker. Aviator sunglasses look cool on pilots in movies, but in real life, they don't wear polarized glasses. First off, they have a glare-reducing effect. This can cause some trouble in the cockpit. A pilot has to read instruments, but the stuff in the cockpit, such as LCD displays, emits polarized light. So a pilot with those cool polarized glasses can't read the displays with 100% efficiency. Pilots shouldn't wear these glasses simply because of safety concerns. Imagine a shimmer of glare coming from another plane's windscreen, but the pilot missed the sign because of polarized sunglasses. Ever noticed a hole in the tail of an airplane? Well, most commercial airplanes have it. Next time you get into an airplane, take a closer look. The hole has a fancy name, auxiliary power unit. It looks like a hole from the outside, but that is actually a hidden turbine engine. Most of the time, the APU will remain off for the entire flight. It will start working when the plane lands. It provides power to the cabin lights, air conditioning, and cockpit electronics. Don't underestimate the APU's power, though. It can also provide the power required to start the main engines. You've watched a bright side video and learned what the APU is. A perfect icebreaker. Unfortunately, you're not in a chatty mood. You just want to take the plane, land, and start your vacation. Yet again, there is only one door to board. You are at the end of a queue. Why don't planes generally have multiple doors? According to the experts, the biggest issue is that the bridge takes up a lot of space. When an aircraft is loaded from the front and the rear, it takes up two slots. This is not ideal for the administrators. Newly remodeled or constructed terminals tend to have dual boarding compared to the older terminals. Change of scenery, let's jump into a cruise ship. There are hidden passageways and secret doors in ships. These secrets are from an insider. Staff on the ship mostly work in their designated area. How does a worker get from one place to another without using the stairs and doors that the passengers use? There is a network of corridors and stairs all around the ship, used only by the crew. I mean it when I say secret doors. They blend with the walls, so they go undetected by those who don't know where the door is. Maybe you can stumble by accident. Here's a clue. Pay attention to the walls near the guest stairs. Try to think of those gigantic cruise ships as floating metals. This leads me to a cruise cabin fun fact. The walls of the cruise ship cabin are magnetic. Imagine you're traveling to multiple countries on board a cruise ship, a single month voyage. You collect destination themed magnets and decorate your cabin. True cruise fans know this magnet magic, so they put a couple of magnetic hooks into their luggage. Neat tip, use magnetic hooks to add extra storage in your cabin. Hang clothes and accessories, postcards, or hats. Speaking of ships, why do some ships and boats have small holes constantly releasing water? To keep the bilge free of water. Water builds up over time inside the bilge, and the bilge pump automatically pumps the water out again. Ships don't have headlights. Using a headlight could prevent accidents. If they work for cars, why not for ships? Headlights are the source of light, but the light that comes out of them bounces back at the light source at some point. With cars, for instance, headlights work because the area you want lit is narrow, and you can easily take action if you see an obstacle on the road. For ships, this is super hard. The light source should be powerful enough to light the area the captain wants to see. Large cargo ships, for instance, need more than a mile to stop or take action. Plus, imagine how much brighter should the ship's light be to light the whole area in front of it. They do see each other with different sorts of lights called navigation lights. These are small but practical. They arrange it in a standardized way 
so that ships could see each other. The exciting thing is that they don't just notice one another in the dark, they also understand each other's movements and directions. Here's an example. Imagine a ship with two nav lights. The one on the front is lower, near the ship floor. The other one on the back is high up. This means the vessel goes to the right. It can safely pass by the other ships without hitting them. Trains don't have seatbelts. A bit weird. Every time there is a crash related to trains, this matter comes up. Pretty much nowhere in the world seatbelts are used on trains. Various studies have been made about this issue. Some of them created simulations of accidents, and the results were surprising. Using a seatbelt on a train could potentially increase the number of injuries. In cars, seatbelts are highly effective in protecting the passenger and are used all the time. The logic behind the seatbelt is to protect the person when a collision causes rapid deceleration. But trains carry so much momentum that they don't stop rapidly. On a plane, passengers use a seatbelt on takeoff, during landing, and if turbulence occurs. There are no such things for trains. Entering and leaving a station is not a high risk. Experts believe focusing and making investments are other ways to improve railway safety. Now, you are traveling by train. You look outside the window. There are small stones along the railway tracks to accompany you on the journey. Those stones are formerly known as track ballast. They do a very important job. They provide support to and maintain the tracks. They're not there by mere coincidence, though. Now look at the stones closer. You can notice that there is no single smoothly cut stone on the tracks because they're not regular stones randomly poured at the rails. Each rock has sharp and abrupt edges. Sharp edges hold on to each other. They protect the railroad from harsh concussions. They facilitate water drainage in heavy rain and keep down the grass and other weeds. Now imagine replacing those with round pebbles. They will slide down. Eventually, the ballast will spread out and tracks will fall apart. The last thing you would want, especially if you were a passenger on that train. It seems strange that a commercial jet doesn't have keys to turn it on, but it's a bit more complicated than just turning a key. Instead, there's a series of buttons and dials on the control board that starts the complicated process. A battery provides the power to the aircraft that is charged through a small electric generator within the jet's tail. Airflow gets in and moves into the jet's engines to keep them cool. A reserve power then warms the turbines by turning them slowly until they start spinning at the right rate. Then, the engines can be turned on, one at a time. With up to four engines on a commercial jet, this entire process can take up to 90 minutes. Planes don't have keys to lock the doors either. But when they sit idle, jets have security guards constantly monitoring them. But even if someone happened to get past them, it wouldn't be a quick getaway. When you enter the plane, the captain keeps a close eye on the boarding process. They are not only in command of the flight deck, but also of the passenger's cabin. To become a commercial pilot, you gotta have a distance vision of at least 20-20. But depending on the airline, it's sometimes okay if your perfect vision is assisted with glasses. It's time to find a seat on the plane. You checked in late, and you've already had an unpleasant experience of not getting on your flight like that in the past. This is because airlines purposely overbook their flights, just in case there are no-shows or cancellations. So, you didn't get to choose your seat this time. You walk past the front seats in jealousy. There are seats that are always taken much faster because everyone wants to leave the plane as soon as possible after it lands. But if you're choosing safety over early departure, the back is the place to be. It's estimated to be 40% safer in the rear end of the plane. Maybe you'd prefer to drive instead of flying? The chances of something dangerous happening to a plane during a flight are 1 in 11 million. Compare it to the likelihood of a car accident, which is 1 in 5,000. You've been placed at the emergency exit. Excellent! More legroom! Over the past 30 years, legroom has been decreasing more with every year. Up to 5 inches on some airlines. No, you haven't been getting taller. The reason behind this is the more people they're able to fit in, the more money the airline makes. Airlines don't build their own aircraft and use factory-made planes. From there, each airline will determine its own seating structure. This is also why the seats don't line up with the windows. But it doesn't matter, you have the best seat, 
Although it's always a bit concerning when sitting next to an emergency door. What if you accidentally knocked it while asleep and opened it? Relax, it's actually impossible to open these doors while flying. The air pressure inside pushes against every square inch of the cabin. On the door itself, this pressure equates to 1,000 pounds across every square foot of the door. But even if you somehow developed Hulk-like strength in your sleep, you still wouldn't be able to open it as there's a series of electrical and mechanical devices that latch it closed. The extra measures are important as the moment the door opens, the entire cabin temperature would quickly drop, and that drastic change in pressure would weaken the plane's structure. It's time for takeoff, and they've asked you to turn your phone off. Should you really? 10% of people have admitted that they don't turn theirs off and don't even set them to airplane mode. Cell phones can cause issues, but they don't disrupt the electronics as you might believe. There is a genuine concern that while you're flying in the air, your phone can receive signals from multiple towers on the ground, providing stronger distractions for the pilots. So let's make their job a little easier and turn it off. The plane has reached 40,000 feet, your ears have popped, and the seatbelt sign is turned off. The flight attendant walks down the aisle with their arms held outward. Within such a thin passage, they walk this way as it helps with their balance. They try to avoid disrupting passengers, so they don't use the headrest of the seats. And in case of sudden turbulence, there are special grabbing spots under the overhead luggage bay. It's estimated that half a million people are flying in the sky at any given time. So right now, you're part of that special group involving 0.1% of the world's population. You look out the window and notice the white wings. Planes are painted white and other lighter colors as well to help reflect solar radiation. This avoids damage from the sun by reducing the amount of heat the plane receives. But further in the distance, dark clouds approach, and the plane is heading towards a thunderstorm. Since it's made of metal, it has to be a big electric conductor, right? Thankfully, jets are fitted with an aluminum shell that conducts electricity very well. The cabin's interior is completely shielded from lightning, protecting electrical systems and leaving us carbon-based mammals unhurt. A plane is so perfectly built for electrical storms that it's one of the safest places to be. There haven't been any major incidents from a storm since the 1960s. You're thirsty and you're aware that you should have brought your own water. When aircrafts land at each location, they refill their water supplies. The water quality in a plane is based on where they collected the vital liquid. Many things contribute to the water quality of every airport. Water cabinets, trucks, carts, and hoses all could be of different standards. In 2019, an airline water study found that most airlines weren't providing clean water, so the general recommendation is to only drink water from a sealed bottle and avoid even tea. But the food is perfectly fine. As you sit back down, you notice the cabin is cold. Super cold, to be honest. It's intentionally set to around 71 degrees Fahrenheit for a good reason. When people become vulnerable to fainting, it's due to not receiving enough oxygen. And when there's warm air mixed with high cabin pressure, fainting becomes more common. So, while the cold air is helping those who need it, you've been provided with a blanket for your comfort. Warmed up with a blanket, you notice the dry air running through your nose, and it dehydrates your lips and eyes. But don't worry, the air is completely safe and very clean. 40% of the air is recycled and goes through a thorough cleaning system to remove all dust and airborne bacteria, and the other 60% comes from the outside. The humidity levels in the air get very low, and that's why you feel all that discomfort. It's now dark outside as the plane begins its descent to land, and the lights are dimmed. The dimmed lights aren't for the pilots or crew or those at the airport. They're for you. If something goes wrong while landing when it's dark, they'll have to start an emergency procedure. The dimmed lights are there to help your eyes adjust and help you follow towards the exit in the dark easier. But luckily, today, it won't be necessary as your journey has come to an end. Is the sky like a desert? Can a commercial aircraft fly faster than the speed of sound? Can you fix a plane with a piece of tape? Let's check your intuition with this cool truth or myth airplane quiz. 
Make sure to note down your correct answers and share your score in the comments. So, the first one for you. Commercial airplanes are more fuel efficient than your car. True or false? That's actually true. Commercial flights have been more fuel efficient per person per mile than cars for more than a decade. Better technologies and a larger number of people that fit in one plane have decreased the energy intensity of traveling by air by almost 74%. As for cars, it's been just a 57% drop. Okay, how about this one? There's no row 13 on a plane. Well, come to think of it, I've never seen a 13A or any other letter on my boarding pass. What about you? That's true, but only partially. In those countries where the number 13 is considered unlucky, there's really no row 13. But in other countries, the missing number may differ depending on what is believed to bring bad luck there. Opening a plane door during the flight is a real safety risk. It sounds kind of terrifying to me, but is it true? You can relax, that's just a myth. For one thing, the doors are locked, but even if they weren't, no one can open the door of a flying plane. It's physically impossible. The cabin pressure won't allow anybody to do it. When an airplane is at cruising altitude, it's pressurized. The difference between the inside and outside is huge. In other words, the pressure inside the cabin pushes on the door and doesn't allow anyone to open it from the inside. Even better, the airplane door is called a plug door. Its inner edge is wider than the outer. That's why it acts like a bathtub drain stopper, corking the doorway without falling through. Your skin is drier on a plane than it would be in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Can you believe this? And if you think this is true, you're absolutely right. The airplane cabin is pressurized and the humidity there is set to 20%. For comparison, in the Sahara Desert, the average air humidity is around 25% and your skin is used to at least 40% of humidity. That's why your nose and throat feel so dry when you're flying. Several years ago, someone posted a photo on the internet that became viral in no time. In this image, there was an airline technician, and he seemed to be fixing a plane with duct tape. So the question is, could it be true, or was it just a fake? The answer isn't so simple. It wasn't your regular duct tape, so partially, this fact is a myth. But it was some kind of tape, known as speed tape. It costs around $700 per roll, it's actually an aluminum adhesive you can use to temporarily mend minor damage until you can repair it properly. Is it true that pilots avoid the Bermuda Triangle? After all, it has such a notorious reputation. Ships and planes simply disappear into thin air in this region. This one is certainly a myth. Today, people already know that there's no particular danger in the Bermuda Triangle and planes fly over this area as usual. Airplanes mostly fly on their own, with autopilots doing all the work. Myth or truth? What's your bet? It's a widespread myth. Many people are sure that planes are some super automated mechanisms that can fly mostly by themselves, and pilots are there simply for backup. In reality though, flying is a hands-on job. It needs constant attention and a skilled flight crew. There once was a plane that flew twice faster than the speed of sound. Hmm, can it be true, or is it too far-fetched? This fact is definitely not a myth. The Concorde could reach a speed of 1,330 miles per hour. That's much faster than the speed of sound, which is around 767 miles per hour. And that's indeed almost twice as slow as the Concorde. You might have heard this scary fact before. Planes empty toilets right in the air. Sounds alarming, but is it true? Fortunately, that's only a myth. There's absolutely nothing to this legend. Airplane toilets use a vacuum-based system to transport all the contents out of the bowl and into a special tank. It's located in the rear part of the aircraft, and this tank gets emptied only on the ground. Ah, this is a tricky one. When a plane is flying towards the east, it can reach higher speeds. So, can the speed really depend on the direction? And... This is true. It's possible thanks to high-altitude winds, known as jet streams. They blow at a speed of 100 to 300 miles per hour. And since our planet rotates from west to east, aircraft moving in the same direction can use these winds to move faster. 
Do you think pilots can control airflow to keep passengers sleepy and relaxed and save on fuel? This one is definitely a myth. If you ask a pilot this question, you might hear ridiculous in reply. The truth is that pressurization determines the oxygen level in the cabin. How about this one? The world's tallest air traffic control tower is as high as a skyscraper. Can it be true? Or is it just an impressive myth? I know it's hard to believe, but it's actually true. When an airplane lands, it needs the assistance of runway lights and airport beacons. It's part of the responsibilities of the air traffic control tower. It also manages ground traffic. No wonder such construction needs to be extra tall. The new Bangkok International Airport in Thailand has a 430-foot four-tall tower. Its height is almost the same as the height of a 40-story building. It cost $18 million to build the tower. I've got another tough one for you. The sensitivity of your taste buds dropped by 30% during the flight. Yes or no? This is true. The pressure in the cabin combined with the dryness of the air kind of numbs your taste buds. But the most curious thing here is that this mostly affects salty and sweet flavors. If you're served something spicy or bitter, you can still taste it as usual. Airline caterers try to take the decreased sensitivity of your taste buds into account while preparing airplane meals. They have to modify lots of good old recipes to make your food taste better. As soon as your oxygen mask is on, in case the cabin is depressurized, you can relax and breathe out. You can still use it till the end of the flight. I wish it was true, but is it? Sadly, it's a myth. Passenger oxygen masks usually provide enough air to breathe normally for 10 to 15 minutes. In other words, it's just a temporary solution. But in most cases, this time is enough for the plane to go down to the altitude of 10,000 feet. That's where people can breathe without using oxygen masks. And since planes descend very fast, the need for additional oxygen lasts for a few minutes at most. By the way, the oxygen system gets tested regularly during special maintenance checks. Plus, both passengers' and pilots' oxygen flow doesn't depend on electricity. Masks use individual oxygen generators, so even if there's some electrical problem on board, the oxygen doesn't get cut off. Many people say that the plane is the safest means of travel, but do you believe in it? That's a myth. Flying is the second safest. Studies show that the elevator is safer. Unfortunately, it won't be able to take you to the Bahamas. Okay, this last one was kind of a joke. Statistically, planes are indeed the safest way to get to your destination. So, how many correct answers did you have? Tell me in the comments below. Me, eight. Duh. The plane had been in the air for a mere 25 seconds when the pilots noticed weird noises and bizarre vibrations. They tried several ways to improve the situation, but nothing worked. The engine surges continued, and just over a minute into the flight, when the plane reached 3,000 feet, both engines failed. First the right one, two seconds later the left one. The pilots decided to return to the airport they had just left. At the same time, they tried to restart the engines. Nothing seemed to work. The flight crew made a decision to pitch the plane down and then level it off. Perhaps it could help them gain some speed for the glide. But soon, they realized they wouldn't make it to the airport. Was the plane going to crash? That's when the miracle at Gotrura occurred. The morning before the flight started as usual. Regular pre-flight procedures, good weather. The members of the flight crew were experienced pilots. A 44-year-old Danish captain with over 8,000 flight hours under his belt and a 34-year-old first officer from Sweden with 3,000 hours. So, what could go wrong? The plane itself was almost brand new. It was a McDonnell Douglas MD-81 nicknamed Dana Viking. It made its first flight on March 16, 1991. By that fateful day, the aircraft had been in service for a mere nine months. There were 122 passengers and seven crew members on board. Flight 751 Scandinavian Airlines was a scheduled flight from Stockholm, Sweden to Warsaw, Poland. On the way, the plane was supposed to make a stop in Copenhagen, Denmark. 
The aircraft took off from Stockholm according to its schedule at 8.47 a.m. local time. But by that point, the people inside had already been doomed, all because of a terrible sequence of events before the departure. It started the night before. The plane arrived at Stockholm Airport after a flight from Zurich. It was 10.09 p.m. The aircraft spent the night at the gate outside. It was cold. The temperature dropped to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, just above freezing. What made the situation even worse was that almost 6,000 pounds of freezing cold fuel, chilled during the night, still remained in the tanks located in the wings. The fuel was so cold because the plane had been flying at the cruising altitude, where the air temperature outside the cabin varied from minus 61 to minus 80 degrees. The flight from Zurich lasted around 1 hour and 40 minutes. Soon after midnight, a flight technician came to check on the aircraft. The man had to remove some slush from the landing gear, otherwise he wouldn't be able to examine it. At around 2 a.m., when he was leaving, he noticed some ice covering the upper part of the wings. By the morning, the situation had become even dire. A layer of clear, almost invisible ice had formed on the tops of the wings. The plane had to leave the gate at around 8.30 a.m. An hour before the departure, the mechanic responsible for the plane noticed that some ice covered the underside of the wings. He decided to make sure there was no ice on the tops of the wings. He climbed a ladder and put one knee on the wing. Then he bent forward to touch the front part of the wing. There was no ice, just some slush. The mechanic decided to make sure everything was fine with the air inlet of one of the engines. He didn't find anything abnormal. Soon after that, the personnel used more than 220 gallons of de-icing fuel to remove ice from the plane. The mechanic consulted with the captain of the aircraft and ordered the staff to de-ice the underside of the wings as well. After all, he had seen some ice there. But no one thought to double-check if there was clear ice on the tops of the wings. After they had finished the procedure, the mechanic reported to the captain, "Uh, We're done here. The icing finished. There was a lot of snow and ice, but everything's clear now. The captain thanked the mechanic and carried on with the pre-flight procedures. The plane taxied to the runway. Its engine's anti-ice systems were switched on and didn't show any malfunction. But several passengers later claimed they had seen ice sliding off the upper side of the wings while the plane had been taking off. And still, the plane left the ground and headed for Stockholm as usual. But shortly after the takeoff, several pieces of the overlooked ice broke off. At full speed, they slammed into the fans of the engines near the tail on both sides of the plane, ruining the blades. It led to a series of surges, and the rest is history. Meanwhile, somewhere in the cabin, Scandinavian Airlines flight captain Per Holmberg, who was on board as a passenger, noticed something was amiss. At first, he informed the flight attendant sitting in the rear jump seat that the right engine was surging. She tried to contact the flight crew, unsuccessfully. Then, the ununiformed captain rushed to the cockpit and asked if he could help the pilots. The first officer gave him the emergency checklist, and the captain asked him to start the auxiliary power unit, a small gas turbine in the tail of the plane. Holmberg's advice and help were invaluable. But was it enough to save the plane and the people inside? When the plane emerged from the cloud cover at an altitude of 890 feet, the pilots realized they wouldn't have enough time to make it back to the airport. An immediate emergency landing was unavoidable. The assisting captain passed the order to the cabin crew, and they started preparing the passengers. There was a large field to the north of the plane, but the captain realized they didn't have enough time to reach it. So he chose a much smaller field in a forested area in the direction of flight. It was not far from the village of Gotrura in upland Sweden. The plane was just 1,300 feet above the ground when the assisting captain started extending the flaps. At a height of 183 feet, the captain reported to Stockholm Control, We're crashing to the ground! Seven seconds later, the plane hit several trees and lost a huge chunk of its right wing. By that time, the landing gear had already been extended and the speed had decreased to 139 miles per hour. 
Moments later, the plane's tail struck the ground and broke off. The aircraft kept sliding across the field, still at high speed. It traveled 360 feet, with its main landing gear leaving marks on the field. At one point, the plane lost the main and nose landing gear. Its fuselage broke into three parts. Miraculously, there was no fire. If you look at the pictures from the crash site, the plane torn into pieces, with its parts scattered across the field, it's hard to believe that all 129 people on board the plane survived. It seems like a miracle. But it was also thanks to the flight attendant's quick reaction and the correct instructions they gave the passengers. They didn't panic and told the people to adopt the brace position just in time to avoid fatalities. Even more surprising, almost all passengers, except for four people, made their way out of the plane on their own. No wonder this accident was nicknamed the Miracle. The aircraft, though, wasn't as lucky. The nine-month-old plane was damaged so badly that it was an immediate write-off. Everyone praised the actions of the flight crew. The landing was incredibly skilled, especially in such a fast-developing, very dangerous situation. The captain himself admitted that few pilots were ever forced to put to the test the skills they got during training, at least not to this degree. He said he was proud of his crew and relieved that everyone had survived. And... He never returned to piloting commercial planes. That little yellow hook you can see from the airplane's window if you're sitting next to the wing is there to help you in case of an emergency landing. Inflatable slides can only be deployed from the emergency exit doors in the front and the tail of the plane. In the middle, the passengers would have to walk right out on the wing and get to the ground from there. But jumping from the plane wing isn't safe because it's just too high. And here's where those little yellow hooks come in handy. The flight attendants tie ropes from the doors and through the loops for the passengers to hold on to. This way, everyone can safely get to the ground without injuries. Now, you want to try to avoid cozying up under airplane blankets. Some airlines only wash them about once a month. Better use your own travel blanket, a scarf, or a jacket. And always remember to wear your shoes while walking around the plane. That carpet on the floor can't and won't be clean to perfection between flights. It's just too much time and effort for the cabin crew. The dirtiest place on a plane isn't the bathroom. It's your tray table. It has 8 times more bacteria than an onboard toilet flush button. Now, in case of emergency, oxygen masks only have enough airflow to last for about 15 minutes. Luckily, it's just the amount of time a plane needs to find a suitable landing place or to at least descend to the altitude where people won't need oxygen masks anymore. You may wonder why you're asked to lift your seat back and close your tray table before takeoff and landing. 